Let's see. Okay. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for NCEA's Promoting the Knowledge of the Faith webinar. My name is Kate Reich, and I am the organizer for today's event. Before we begin, please know that all of your microphone connections have been muted. If you have any questions during today's presentation, please send those through the question box that appears in your GoToWebinar panel. To ask a question, please use, pardon me, please use your mouse and click into the blank box area, type your question using your keyboard, and then click Send. The webinar presentation will last 40 minutes, and any questions you have asked will be addressed in the remaining time. Later this evening, you will receive an email asking you to complete a brief evaluation about this webinar, as well as information about creating a certificate of attendance. I thank you in advance for providing us with feedback about today's webinar. We will be sending you another email with instructions on accessing this recorded webinar and presentation files in another business day or two. Now I am happy to introduce Mickey Abada Marco, Associate Executive Director of NCEA's Religious Education Department, who wishes to share a few words. Welcome, Mickey. Thank you, Kate. Today we welcome Bishop Frank Caggiano, Bishop of the Diocese of Bridgeport, Connecticut, as our presenter for the fourth webinar in the series on the six tasks of catechesis. The focus of this webinar is knowledge of the faith. A noted catechist, Bishop Caggiano was invited by Pope Benedict XVI to deliver World Youth Day talks in Sydney in 2008 and in Madrid in 2011, and by Pope Francis to serve as a catechist at World Youth Day in Rio de Janeiro in 2013. He is a member of the Subcommittee on the Catechism of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops Committee on Evangelization and Catechesis. Bishop Frank, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, Mickey, thank you. And I'm, I'm delighted to be able to, um, to uh, share this webinar and also to, import, uh, to present this very important topic. And my hope is to uh, begin a conversation about faith literacy and really to, um, to allow those who are participating an opportunity to, uh, to think through some basic issues and also to raise questions because we're beginning a conversation and which will last far beyond the length of this webinar. Uh, in order to, um, to give a context to what I wish to present, uh, allow me just to begin by offering three, if you will, premises or presumptions. Uh, the first, is the topic that we are addressing, promoting knowledge of the faith, I believe has a tremendous urgency. And it is timely for that reason. Uh, we have been called to develop models that are successful in the evangelization of both believers and non-believers. An evangelization that recognizes catechesis as a privileged moment in a larger process of evangelization. And part of the urgency that I sense in doing this and doing this well comes from Pope Francis himself. Because I believe we are all in agreement that he certainly has created uh, an excitement and a genuine curiosity among believers and non-believers. And he's done it many different ways. He's certainly done it by his teaching. He's also done it by his example and by much of what he's doing, which I characterize almost as prophetic, as calling the people of God to a deeper reflection of what it means to be disciples of the Lord. And therefore, I think cumulatively speaking, he is creating a, what I call a second look. People are looking again at the church, particularly people who may have left active worship in our church. They're taking a second look and saying, well, what is this church all about? What is this Catholic faith all about? So there's an urgency. But as catechetical leaders, all of us who are part of this webinar, um, there are two immediate tasks, if you will. First is to recognize that that excitement and that curiosity, <coughs> this window, if you will, is not going to be open forever. Even the most enthusiastic of individuals will, in short order, 
be looking for the concrete response that touches their own particular life and can help them to grow in faith. Now, I think that challenge falls to us because faith is lived on the local level. And any evangelical outreach is most effective when it is local and personal and fits the circumstances of wherever you or I may live. So effective evangelization and catechesis is really done one person at a time. And therefore, this urgency that the Holy Father's pontificate is beginning to create is a challenge for all local leaders and particularly catechists that we create an effort that is sustainable and credible in its outreach, that it can touch people's lives very deeply. Now there's a second, if you will, uh, premise to kind of encapsulate everything that I'm going to be offering, and that is I think we need at this moment to admit the fact that among all of the challenges we face, there is one challenge in particular that I believe is quite, quite hard, if you will, to grapple with, to fully understand its implications, and yet it is certainly right there in our midst. And that is the challenge of indifference. Indifference is growing among many both in the church and in the larger community. And of course, there are many reasons for that. I mean, institutions in general nowadays, many people are suspicious of them. There have been past betrayals, particularly of leaders in whatever institution you want to talk about. There's a growing individualism in the world. And technology itself, all right, has created an environment where it's become very, very isolated individual. Be that as it may, the dynamic of indifference needs to be understood because it poses a particular challenge for the work of evangelization. For example, I remember growing up, I loved my sister very dearly. My sister is four years older than I am. And we always used to fight. Even sometimes as adults we used to fight. But when I recognize, when I look back on those occasions when we did, whatever hostility existed between us, it made a presumption, and the presumption is that we still cared enough about each other to be angry with each other because anger presumes a relationship. Indifference, on the other hand, is detachment. It is the sense of leave me alone, don't bother me, you know, the code word of this all is boring. That indifference can only be met by engagement and how we engage those who are indifferent or becoming indifferent is at the heart of much of what we're going to be discussing today as we promote the faith and knowledge of the faith. The third premise, if you will, or starting presumption is just simply this. I come to you as a pastor. I do not come as a, a person who has been professionally trained to be a catechetical leader. So I am not going to review the many things that all who are participating in this webinar already know. My task is to come as a pastor to ask broader questions that will allow us, all of us, to understand the ministry of catechesis perhaps more deeply. So in a world where in ministry we all get wrapped up in the trees, I want to look at the forest today and perhaps ask some very fundamental questions to again begin this conversation. And the questions are three, and they flow from the very topic of our presentation together. The first is, what do we mean by faith? The second is, what does it mean when we say to have knowledge or literacy of the faith? And then the third is, how do you and I promote such a knowledge? And I'm offering these questions in the spirit of St. Thomas who said, um, never deny, seldom affirm, and always distinguish. So let's take a few minutes to look at the first question. What do we mean by faith? I mean, it's an obvious, it's obvious. 
on some level. I mean, faith is what brings us together. It's at the fundamental, it's the foundation of everything that we do and who we are as a people. So one could initially say, well, that's, you know, has an obvious answer. Well, I'm not exactly sure that it has such an obvious answer because on some level faith is a mystery and it is understood over a lifetime and it's understood by experiencing and living it. But we can say much. First, faith is both a divine gift and a human response. And that human response is a lifetime process. To say it's a divine gift, we hear that from the words of the Lord himself in the 16th chapter of Matthew's Gospel in the 17th verse. All right, after Peter makes his profession of faith, Jesus said that what Peter said was revealed not by flesh and blood, but by his heavenly Father. Right? The Holy Spirit is the author of all faith. The Spirit given to move our hearts to accept the revelation of God. So we know from the Catechism that faith is a theological virtue, which means it's a gift given by God and infused into us. In fact, in the sacrament of baptism, when the indwelling of the Holy Spirit comes to us, it is the Spirit's power that moves us and assists us by opening our minds. We speak of enlightenment and opening our heart to the truth of faith. And therefore, it's very consoling that faith is a gift that you cannot earn or you cannot achieve on your own. But rather, as we grow older, this gift given to us is deepened in response to hearing the offer of salvation preached to us in an effective manner. And that one sentence I just uttered has four particular elements. You know, to hear the offer of salvation, to hear it, not just with our ears, but with our minds and our hearts, that hearing, that openness. And of course, it's an offer of salvation. It's not just an offer to live life comfortably or, you know, self-help, or philosophy of life. It's the offer of salvation. It's the forgiveness of sin. It's the gift of eternal life in the offer of Jesus, who is the one definitive redeemer of all creation. And it's to be preached to us. And again, it's like St. Francis said, it's preached sometimes without words. It's preached not in the pulpit alone, but by the witness of Christian lives. And that's why it needs to be effective, and that's at the root of what we're, we're discerning in the contemporary age of the church. So, it is a gift. The gift demands a personal response. And that response, the church teaches us, is trust and submission. It's the submitting of our lives to what we have heard and received. It's the submitting of our minds and our hearts and our will. And more specifically, as we receive this presence and revelation of God through the church, then concretely, we embrace the profession of the faith and the creed. We joyfully celebrate the sacraments. We live a moral life that fulfills the commandments of the Lord. And we respond in personal prayer and outreach and service to, the, to those who are in need. That's the gift and response to faith. Now, it seems to me that there are two immediate implications for faith literacy when you look at it in those terms. First is that Whatever the indicators are that judge a healthy relationship between human beings are the same indicators or categories we need to employ to deepen a relationship of faith with God. Meaning that catechesis must, without question, have a cognitive aspect, an affective aspect a spiritual aspect, a communal aspect, an aspect in service. Because that is what mirrors any good, healthy, and holy personal relationship. The same would be true with our God. And therefore, in every aspect of life, faith needs to be demonstrated. In the end, faith is calling us to witness to literally allow every moment of our lives to be a testimony to this relationship we have with Jesus the Lord. And we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, in a few minutes. But before we go on to the second question, there's one other aspect I would just like to, to emphasize a bit. Faith is not only a divine gift and a human response, but it is lived within community. 
And that, I think, is where we have most of our challenge. Because I'm sure everyone who is listening to this webinar has heard it said one time or another from very well-meaning individuals when they say, yeah, I'm spiritual, uh, but I'm not religious. And of course, in my mind, um, that is a code word of saying, yeah, I am spiritual. That is, I am searching for God. I want a relationship with God. But I'm not sure I need you for that relationship. You know, spiritual is me, and religious is we, when you hear it in that context. And therefore, the crisis, if you will, in the contemporary church is the credibility of the community. Why is it that my search for God, or even my relationship with the Lord Jesus, demands a community that I need to enter into? Not a community I could create for myself, or quite frankly, to do it on my own. And therefore, as Catholics, we remember that faith is deeply personal, but it is never private. And the reason for that is simply this, that Jesus said, where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there in your midst. That the church community, wherever it is manifest, is the enduring mystical presence of Christ in the world. And therefore, when we speak of catechesis, then, we can never forget that communal aspect. And for us as Catholic Christians, that communal aspect also includes the living tradition and the work of the magisterium in allowing that community to remain authentic, consistent, and faithful to the Lord. My sense is, and I can certainly stand corrected, my sense is young people still intuit the desire all right, to be part of a community, as much as technology is changing their lives, and their desire to be of service, to make a concrete, tangible difference in the lives of people, is one of the clearest indications that young people still very much eagerly desire to be part of a community that's relevant, that's serving, and that makes a difference in their lives. And so, in the end, it seems to me that Whatever we say about faith, this communal aspect has to be held at the forefront because it seems to me that is the aspect of faith that is under the greatest challenge. So what is faith? Faith is an establishment of an enduring personal relationship with the Lord Jesus in and through the community of the church. So what is our second question then? What does it mean to have knowledge of the faith? And I don't think we can answer that question when we speak of faith literacy, unless we look deeply into the dynamic of love itself. I often ask people in their mind's eye to recall the moment when they first fell in love with someone and to recall the dynamics of what happened, how you desire to know so much about that person, that you long to be in the presence of that person, that you wanted to communicate with that person, and sometimes we fumbled to try to find the right words because the deep desire and passion and, and commitment sometimes defy the ability to describe in words fully and completely. And in the end, we just longed for presence, to be with that person because we knew that that person now had touched us so deeply, we were not complete without that person. And those of you who are married, I think, you hear the echoes of that falling in love and sharing that marital life, which is such a beautiful vocation in the life of the church. So when we say knowledge of the faith, we are really talking about falling in love with the Lord and the knowledge that comes from love in every dimension of what that means. So true faith literacy cannot be achieved unless that loving relationship with the Lord is also growing. Because in the end, if that relationship of love with the Lord does not exist, then faith literacy is just reduced to another academic course that someone needs to learn about, and it will not make an iota of difference in their lives. And unfortunately, in many of our catechetical programs, some of our older students, particularly confirmation students, struggle with this 
because if they have not yet had the opportunity to develop this relationship, going to religion class is just simply like going to math class. And they are fundamentally different. Now, one way to, to break this open further for reflection is just simply to make a distinction. And there's a distinction I, I readily use, and I offer it for the, for the ongoing reflection of those who are part of this webinar, and that is we as Catholics, when we speak of knowledge of the truth, knowledge of our faith, we're talking about knowledge of the truth, capital T, singular, and the knowledge of the truths of the faith in the plural, small t. And faith literacy demands both, knowledge of both. What do I mean? Pontius Pilate's question to Jesus, what is the truth, is a poignant question because Pilate had no idea that the answer was in front of him because the answer was a person. It was a person. I am the way, the truth, and the life. At the heart of this loving relationship I'm speaking of, which is faith, is the truth, capital T, the person of Jesus Christ, encountered through the community of the church. Over the centuries, in the mystical body of Christ, we have spent long, long reflection and discernment under the power of grace to try to explain different aspects of the truth who is the person of Jesus Christ in and through the church. And so those are the truths of our faith, small t, all right, in the plural. They are the essential, defined, doctrinal articulations of who the truth is. They're revealed under the power of the Holy Spirit under the guidance of the magisterium, in the sacred divine fonts of sacred scripture and tradition. And there are other fonts that we have. Our catechism, the liturgical texts, even the general uh, directory on catechesis and the national directory as well, and so many other magisterial documents. The truths of the faith and the hierarchy that exists among them need to be learned. That's not optional because they always point back to the truth of the faith, who is Jesus the Lord. I mean, we recall the great shift in the Vatican Council. Prior to the Vatican Council, revelation was seen simply as propositional. And therefore, apologetics was all about teaching people the truths of the faith. Catechisms were the principal means of doing catechesis, and the goal was conversion of the mind. But the divine constitution on Revelation, the Verbum spoke of Revelation in broader terms as a Christ event. And therefore, there's a need to introduce the Christ event into the lives of individuals. And therefore, catechesis became, as we say rightly, holistic, age-appropriate, lifelong, because the conversion is simply not of the mind alone, the mind, the heart, the spirit, the hands, one's whole life. So it seems to me, whatever we say about knowledge of the faith, what we are talking about is knowledge of the truth of the person of Jesus, an encounter with the person of Jesus in and through the church, and knowledge of the truths of our faith. It's knowing both about Jesus and knowing Jesus. Now that is a tall order. And Three things, at least, I can offer as, perhaps, points for further reflection and discussion. First, is that catechesis, therefore, is both education and formation. And when we say formation, I like to recall that image of the clay in Isaiah, where the potter is, is God himself molding us, forming us into his image. And so, too, formation in all its aspects is very much an essential part of knowledge of the faith. And therefore, knowledge, its goal is discipleship, is witness. And in a very particular way, parents, parents who are the first bringers of life into the world, and they are the first lovers of their children, are essential partners in catechesis. They're the first and best catechists, precisely because it is through their love and ministry to their children that this encounter with the love who is Jesus, this capital T, 
can most effectively happen. We are all partners in this, in helping that to develop and to introduce the truths of the faith over a lifetime of discernment, prayer, and study. Which then leads me to my last point, my last question. How is it that you promote such a knowledge of the faith? And it seems to me that promotion is more than education. To summarize, it's learning, it's encountering, it's praying, it's serving, it's presence to one another. There's an intellectual and affective component. And Mickey will speak later on about the, the more tangible indicators that have been identified that can help us to gauge the growth in this because we need to do that. But in the end, I want to leave everyone who is part of this webinar reflecting on this word, encounter. Webster's Dictionary defines encounter as coming face to face with someone or something. I like to define it this way. It is allowing the inbreaking of a person into your life and mine. An encounter understood that way involves every aspect of human life. And when encounter is lived well, then the person we encounter, we give to that person the license to rearrange our very life. And it seems to me that the whole purpose of catechesis in a larger moment uh, process of evangelization is to allow the Lord to rearrange the landscape of your life and mine and to allow us as his disciples and witnesses to share his life, his joy, his peace, and his glory. So let me just end by offering a spiritual note, if I may. To do everything I just suggested, which itself is a very awesome and privileged responsibility. There is a spiritual quality that I believe is absolutely essential. And it is the recognition on the part of every catechist and every person involved in the work of evangelization to recognize that if we're about encounter with the truth and learning the truths of our faith, both, that you and I must never forget that the truth, who is Jesus Christ, is far greater than you or I or us combined. We never fully possess the truth. The truth possesses us and claims us. Therefore, just as Copernicus had to break the news to the world that we were not the center of the universe, then there's a need, if you will, for a Copernican revolution of the spirit, that you and I enter into this great work always mindful that it is Christ at the center, not you, not me, and not us. So the one quality I'm referring to is humility. Humility which is badly misunderstood by many who think it is a synonym for groveling or just disparaging of myself or others. And it is the farthest thing from that. Because the Catechism speaks of humility as the foundational principle upon which all prayer is possible because humility is living the truth of who we are. Or to put it another way, to think less of oneself is ingratitude. To think more of oneself is pride. Part of the catechetical method, for particularly those of us who are leaders, is through humility to recognize my own gifts and talents, my own limitations, my own sinfulness, and that profound recognition that God loves me more than I love myself just the way I am. That is the first dawning of humility. And that allows a disciple, you and I, to walk behind our master, to be covered by the dust of his sandals, not because 
we have been relegated to simply being behind the Lord, but because in his love he has drawn us that much closer to him. But humility, I believe, is the essential quality to allow us in this unique age in the life of the church where its credibility as a community is being tested, where it's being asked by the Holy Father in the concrete works of charity and mercy to reestablish that credibility of believing in a God who is love and by our love making him present in the world. In a time when faith, as a personal relationship with the Lord, responding to that gift we have received and nurturing it in our community through an ongoing witness of a lifetime. In this one particular age, it seems to me that if you and I can embrace also the spirit of humility, then I think we have all the elements necessary to, in the years ahead, discover together how promoting knowledge of the faith can be done effectively and can be offered to everyone who is seeking a relationship with the Lord. Mickey, I think you have some additional input and observations to make, and so I welcome you to do that. Thank you, Bishop. I just want to comment on how knowledge of the faith is addressed in the NCEA assessment tools, and then we'll take some time to answer some questions. As many of you know, NCEA's assessment tools for students and adults addresses both the cognitive and the affective aspects of the six tasks of catechesis. IFG ACRE, the student tool, is meant to identify the strengths and weaknesses in a religious education program, both in schools and parishes. The adult assessment, IFG adult survey, looks at the individual and his or her knowledge and relationship with his or her faith. As Bishi Caggiano has stated, catechesis is both learning about Christ and fostering an encounter with Christ. On all levels of the assessments, the basics of the cognitive aspects of our faith are addressed. Trinity, creed, scripture, tradition, and church history. But this is not where it ends. If we look at the cognitive piece, the Catechism of the Catholic Church calls us to live what we know by knowing Christ's call to us in the Gospels using our conscience and deliberate actions that correspond to the dignity of the human person and living by deliberate actions that conform to the good promised by God. The assessments are just one tool to help us further education and conversation of our faith and relationship to Christ. If you have any questions about our assessment tools, please feel free to contact me at NCEA, and I will be happy to walk you through or give you any explanation that you may need. Today, we thank you, Bishop, for your time. And at this time, we'd like to address some questions that were submitted before the webinar began, and if time allows, address some submitted during the session. So our first question is, who are the partners in the process of developing faith literacy and understanding? And I, my thought on this is very simple. Um, promoting knowledge of the faith, the role of catechesis, the ministry of catechesis and evangelization in particular, is not a spectator sport. And unfortunately, for many in our church, they have come to understand developing faith literacy as someone else's ministry. And my response to question number one is to say, everyone has a role to play in promoting knowledge of the faith. Everyone is called in the work to, of evangelization and even catechesis, if we understand it in the broadest context as I described. Most especially, if everyone is called to participate by witness, by example, and by active ministry, then the key partners certainly are parents and catechists, those who are at the front line, those who do it more in a more conscious way. But I think the time has come in the church to remind everyone who is baptized that this work cannot be fully relegated simply to those on the front lines, but it is the work of everyone to be involved with, as we empower parents and our catechists to do what the Lord has asked them to do. 
As for how much more effectively can Catholic schools and religious education programs promote knowledge of the faith by using Catholic textbooks? You know, it's an interesting question because I once was a textbook salesman for McGraw Hill many, many years ago. And an interesting observation was made by my former district manager. Uh, now it's almost eight years ago. Uh, and he had said to me, he said, Frank, do you realize that textbooks, modern textbooks, use about 50% less words than they did 25 years ago? Because the milieu in which we live is changing. That it's becoming much more, because of technology, audio-visually based. And you can see that simply in how young people uh, are responding to stimuli and how they're engaged in so many different things. Uh, on the web. So how can textbooks be used effectively? Well, first, we recognize that they are tools. And it is really the catechist and the parent who need to discern how to use that tool to meet the individual needs of a son, a daughter, or a student. Secondly, it is not the only tool that exists. To my point, there's a whole wealth of audiovisual and web-based materials that now can complement the work of a textbook and can, can be used as an additional resource to textbooks. Because in the end, a textbook itself will have no value if it is not being used as part of a larger strategy, which, please God, is done by the catechist under his or her DRE, and a parent in his or her ministry to their children if it's not part of a larger strategy, then the textbook will not be effective at all. So I think those would be my thoughts on that. As for number three, sustaining the interests of students to participate in ongoing faith formation and become active evangelizers, I think we need to, quite frankly, engage young people in that question. Here in the Diocese of Bridgeport, we are undergoing a diocesan synod. And there is an assembly of young people. They are, if you will, a shadow assembly to the synod delegates themselves, which, which is a group of almost 400 uh, persons from all around the diocese. And I find it fascinating to spend those consultation sessions with the young people because it is very clear to me that they perceive the world in a way that is different from me. It's complementary with mine, but it is still different. And we who are older cannot presume to know what that is. Therefore, to sustain the interest of students, I think any catechist needs to approach his or her students almost in a collaborative way, to have an open heart in that humility I spoke of, and see ultimately what it is that is moving their hearts and engage that as best as possible, keeping within the curriculum and the things that need to get done. Audiovisual materials, web-based materials, interactive materials seem to be most effective in maintaining interests of students because, quite frankly, my sense is attention spans of young and old have become shorter as technology has become more visually based. So that would be my sense. I think they need to help us to answer this question as well. As for increasing Sunday mass attendance among our families, oh, there's many ways to approach this. This is a perennial challenge, and I think every community is struggling with this. I think liturgy needs to be inviting and engaging. I think it needs to respond to the felt needs of individuals. But it is also needs to be right worship. And therefore, it needs to be challenging. Because liturgy cannot simply uh, be a one-way street. It is what we give to individuals and what individuals must give back to the liturgy for it to be truly right worship of God. So I mean, there have been many effective ways to try to increase Sunday Mass, youth Masses, family Masses. Uh, a use of music that is more engaging, all right, involving young people in some of the ministries that's appropriate for them to be involved with. All of those are concrete um, tools that I would encourage. 
but in the end, I think it's a question that's only answered in each individual community because in my 28 years of priestly ministry and eight years as a bishop, one of the lessons I have learned, and perhaps the hard way over time, as I myself have had to relearn the value of humility, is that every single community is different. And we cannot presume to think that one size fits all. So increasing mass attendance, I think, demands a discussion and a dialogue uh, with our families in every community to see how we can engage them and how we can challenge them to be engaged as well. Are there other questions, perhaps? There are. Uh, this is Kate again. Uh, the first one. Kate had some questions. Yeah, for us. thank you. Uh, is uh, since there is so much of the quote spiritual, not religious attitude and understanding from Bishop that spiritual is me and religious is we. How do we help people in being drawn to the we? We help them fall in love, but does wanting to be a part of we follow? Well, again, that's that question is the crux of the challenge. How do we get uh, an individual who is sincerely searching for a relationship with God to see relevance in the we or the community? And my response to that would be this. I think it is the onus falls on the community to evaluate its own witness. Because if that witness is clear and if that witness is genuine, then the works of charity are going to be an essential part of that witness. You know, if a community is truly loving, then it will be welcoming, it will be hospitable, it will be joyful, it will be peaceful, it will be charitable, it will be merciful, and you'll be able to see it. You will not need a poster, you will not need a postcard, people will see it. And once they see it, it will be engaging. And the relevance of the we will have an obvious answer. I think catechesis cannot occur without a full parish renewal also being done at the same time. The renewal of one demands the renewal of the other. And therefore, community becomes engaging when it's obvious that it's a we that I want to belong to. So that would be my suggestion in that regard. Thank you. Uh, second question. If I can just. Oh, go ahead, Nikki. Sorry. No, I just wanted to add something um, to that. I moved to Virginia a couple of years ago and um, was looking for a parish to be a part of. And coming into the parish that I am actively involved in, just that bishop. It was the sense of the. I walked into Sunday mass alone. Um, I was living here alone at the time and knew that I was welcomed from the minute I walked inside the church. And that church holds 1,100 people, and at every Mass, people are standing. Wow. So, yep. you know, it, there is a – and everybody is welcomed. There are all different kinds of groups. Not everybody wants to belong to all of them, but everybody is welcomed. Yes. Uh, that, thank you. That's an excellent illustration. Great. Okay. Second question starts out with, one of the problems that I see and am currently living with has to do with clericalism. Where this idealism still exists, the lay leaders in parishes are removed of the task of bringing ideas to the table. However, when it comes to families, the laity have a deep, excuse me, deeper experience than the religious. Is there any way to overcome this ideology in general as opposed to from parish to parish? Well, I think we go back to this virtue of humility. I mean, in many ways, you, there is division in the church because a division that is, um, that is harmful in the church because we have lost a sense of the complementarity that, it, that should exist in the body of Christ. And priests, Religious and laity each have an essential and distinct role to play in building up the body of Christ. Sometimes in the lived experience of parishes, that's forgotten. 
And when that is forgotten, then we waste energy and we waste time. And in the sinfulness of some of those actions, we harm the body that we profess to love. So it would seem to me that part of what we're about here in promoting knowledge of the faith is unlocking the potential, the energy, right, from each person in his or her distinct and unique state of life towards this revitalization of the church. And the first question every priest, every religious, and every lay person should ask, in my humble opinion, is how can I be of service to the other? And if that becomes the prism, then I think we would be able to unlock this huge reservoir of talent and gifts and enthusiasm and energy that is waiting to be unleashed in this work. So I go back to my, the virtue of humility. I think in the end, um, that's important for all of us to take the heart because that's the only way we're going to really unlock our gifts and talents for the Lord. Okay. And last question is, uh, Bishop, it seems that there are many good resources for helping our youth know about Jesus and the truths of our faith. But what resources would you recommend to help us help our students to know Jesus personally, that is, to help with the spiritual aspect of faith formation? Right. No, that's an excellent question. And again, I think um, I'm not, I, I don't feel comfortable listing out, let's say, a particular catechetical program or a particular online program simply because there are many of them that are out there that are excellent. And I think whoever is going to be using them needs to go through a bit of discernment to make sure that the resource fits the needs of the community. But I would say this. I am the Episcopal Advisor for the National Federation of Catholic Youth Ministries, which is the umbrella organization that really brings to the table every diocese in the country before and 80 different organizations, all involved with youth ministry, catechesis, evangelization. And I think they have a wealth, a wealth of materials available uh, for the use of catechists, people involved in evangelization, people uh, involved with youth service, liturgy, and worship. So I would suggest that whoever wants to look at resources and the availability of resources, in addition to looking at the NCEA, is to also look at the National Federation of Catholic Youth Ministries. I think they will find a whole host of things that, please God, some of them they will find effective and useful. Very good. Thank you. If I can add a piece to that. One of the things that we're uh, dealing with, for lack of a better term, is that parish catechetical leaders, only about 6% um, belong to a national organization. And it's not about belonging to belong, but it's, a, it's about belonging to share ideas, uh, to share different aspects of their, their programs, to, be, to network, to be supportive of each other, and the same thing with youth ministry. And so if we can encourage parish leaders and youth ministers to be part of a larger community, there are so many resources and so many connections that can be made in those forums. Absolutely. Excellent point. All righty. Well, it looks like that is it for questions. Is there any lasting comments you'd like to leave us with? No, I'm just grateful for the opportunity to have shared faith today. And certainly whoever is on this webinar and those who will be listening to it later on, um, you will be in my prayers, and may the Lord continue to bless the wonderful ministry that you do in his service. Thank you. Well, before we conclude today's webinar, I invite you all to visit our website at ncea.org to see the schedule of webinars, including future webinars in the Six Tasks of Catechesis webinar series. I also invite you to join us in Orlando in April for the MPCD Convocation at NCEA 2015. Registration rates will increase in late February, so if you're able to come to convention, please register soon to save on the registration rate.